Now, here's the convicting thing. Even though Jesus is not like that, how do we act like that with other people? All the time. We would call that legalistic. I think we've been treated oftentimes by legalistic people. Maybe we've been on the giving end of being legalistic towards other people. Here's the thing with legalism. It has no pity for other people. Legalism is making my opinion your burden. It is making my opinion your boundary. It's making my opinion your obligation. And you know what? We, people are, they're weary. Not from Jesus being full of grace, but being weary from the way the church has treated them oftentimes. Like I said, we need to understand that we don't play a part in adding to people's burden and guilt. We're called to be agents of grace. Matter of fact, write that word down, grace. That's what we need to be reminded of. We need to not only extend grace to ourselves, but we also need to extend grace to others. Because this thing called life is difficult. And this thing that we call life with God is even more difficult. And we don't need to add to one another's burdens. And yet we are here because this morning is a chance for us to examine our own hearts, to see where we're at when it comes to the topic of, of legalism. God loves the legalists just like he loves the non-legalists. And he is going to bring us to a point, I think, of discovery this morning that, you know, even though Jesus preaches the truth unloving, he doesn't preach the truth unlovingly, he never does it unflinchingly. Meaning, there's a balance of grace and truth in the ministry of Christ that we need to understand. We are called to be people of truth, but we're also called to be people of grace. And so Jesus in Luke 11 addresses a group of people that he's often harshest with. They're called the Pharisees. Now, if you've been with us for any amount of time, you know when we mention the word Pharisee, you, you have to boo really, really loud. So hold on. T today, Jesus gets to deal with the Pharisees. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that's one and done. No more this morning, okay? The word Pharisee is going to pop up a lot. And it, that, you guys, I'm not going to get legalistic about it, but I'm going to call kibosh right now on that. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the experts of the law, the lawyers, the scribes, there's a whole group of people that were responsible to point people toward loving God in a manner of grace, but they didn't point people to God in a manner of grace. They did it with guilt. And I'm going to tell you right now that Jesus had the harshest words to say to that group of people. So Luke 11 is where we're going to be. We're going to notice three groups of people this morning. They're the practitioners, there's the experts, there's the moralists. And I believe that God has a word for us here as we get to unpack this together. Let's read it, the text in our entirety. We're going to go ahead and finish Luke 11 this morning. And if my voice begins to fail, forgive me. I was starting to lose my voice first service. I guess I got really excited, which is very Baptist of me. So here we go. Verse 42 of chapter 11. But woe to you Pharisees. So woe is going to happen six times in this passage. Circle the word woe. Woe is connected to sorrow. He is, he, Jesus is addressing in a very sorrowful way the ways these pe people have been off track when it comes to their walk with God. Verse 42, but woe to you Pharisees, for you pay the tithe of the mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet you disregard justice and the love of God, but these are the things you should have uh, done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love from the front seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you have the, been like concealed tombs and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. And then one of the lawyers raised his hand and said, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. And he says, oh, you want a fresh one as well? Well, woe to you lawyers, experts, scribes, right? Woe to you, lawyers, for you have weighed down men with burdens hard to bear while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. 
Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. Consequently, you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. In order that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I will tell you, I, it shall be charged against this generation. And woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge and you did not enter it yourselves and those who were entering it you hindered. And when he left there, the scribes and Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So what is happening here in this passage? Again, Jesus often had the harshest words to say toward the, rid- the religious community. The people who should have known better who were leading the people in in spiritual living, and yet they were not helping people live for the glory of God. They were hindering people from living for the glory of God. And this is why Jesus issues six woes, three to the Pharisees and three to the lawyers, those that would interpret the law. So let's take each of these woes and unpack them to see not only what they meant in the original uh, context in which Jesus taught, but for us today, because they're very, very relevant to us today. So here we go. First point is he addresses three woes to the practitioners. This is the dangers of legalistic application. The Pharisees were the ones who applied God's law to daily living. They were responsible to take from the lawyers what they interpreted the scriptures to say and then give people the kind of, here's what this looks like in daily living, but they didn't do it well. They actually burdened the people and there are three things we need to consider that Jesus says here. Number one, there was a preoccupation with the trivial, meaning they minored in the majors and they majored in the minors. Has anyone ever heard that expression before? See, how this creeps into our spiritual lives where we tend to miss the spirit of the law because we're so fixated on the letter of the law. And Jesus says, let me commend you, you tithe even on your mint and your rue and your garden herbs. You, you tithe when you, when you look at the cumin and your thyme and your, and your oregano, you, you tithe on those things and God is not against your tithe, but you've done it while ignoring a weightier matter, and that is loving God and showing justice to all people. See, Matthew 23, Jesus says the same thing, and and he adds a couple things to it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. He says, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Meaning there are gnat topics in our lives and there are camel topics in our lives. Matter of fact, write those two creatures down in your notes, gnat and camel. Gnat column, gnat issues, they're they're important but they're small, they're trivial. Camel, would you say is larger than a gnat? Yes. And the camel issues oftentimes go ignored because we're so focused on the gnat issues. And Jesus says to this group that you're focusing on relatively trivial things while you're neglecting massive realities of faith. There's this rigid insistence on on tithing your garden herbs, but you miss loving your neighbor. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you something. You have embraced a, a false spirituality if you are so fixated on tithing your garden herbs and you're missing out loving uh, the, the neighbor who might be poor, might be oppressed, the orphan, the widow, the alien, the stranger. How God had words against Israel in the entire Old Testament and said, you know what? You are missing out on the more significant, more substantive ministry and that is caring for people, being a part in the justice that God wants to bring to our world. Micah chapter six, look what he says here. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? I mean, you can bring all the rams you want to to the house of God. You can even bring 10,000 rivers of oil. 
You can give your firstborn for your sin and the fruit of your body for the sin of your soul. But he says this, but he has told you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. And that's to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't want your sacrifice of, of, of thyme and oregano and dill and cumin. He wants you to speak up for the, the voiceless. He wants you to, to minister on behalf of the orphan and the widow and the illegal alien. See, when you ignore the weightier matters of the law, you're actually disregarding the entire law. And Jesus says, please, please be aware that there are ma- more important issues to focus on. We often are very passionate about our small little practices and we're not passionate about the fact that there are men and women dying without Christ. Would you agree with that? I'm at a men's retreat one time. Now you guys are gonna think I'm a total jerk as as if maybe you don't already think that, but here I go, I'm gonna put myself out there. I'm at a men's retreat one time and there's a group of guys and they were getting into some heated conversation. So like a good pastor, I sneak over to kind of listen to what was being discussed at 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 this table. And these guys were getting into it and I think they were talking about, maybe it was predestination, maybe it was prayer. I'm gonna tell you right now, it was a very insignificant conversation. The way they were going at each other's jugulars and just fighting. And I said, Guy, guys, I have a really important question I want to insert into the equation. What was the last time you shared the love of Jesus with somebody? And they're all like, wah, wah. Well, here comes Scott, rain on everyone's parade again. Don't we tend to get involved in trivial little conversations and arguments and fights and squabble? And right outside our door, there's incredible need to minister to. See, this is what Jesus is getting at. Stop the in-house debates and discussion with, about things that, you know, they, they're not, it's not like they're not important, but they're not important in light of the fact that there's still a, word in, a world in need and the world needs the church to step up and start loving God and loving justice. So that's the problem. Stop being preoccupied with the trivial and take yourself up with the matters that are massive realities of faith all around us. Point number two, not only is there a preoccupation with the trivial, there's also a preoccupation with the limelight. So these guys not only focus on the minors and they miss the majors, but they love to be seen by others. And Jesus says in verse 43 that they occupied seats in the front of the synagogue that were actually up front facing the congregation with all the holy scriptures. So they were seen by everybody. And not only that, when they go out to the marketplace, they wanted to be acknowledged in public. Pastor Scott! Now, I love being acknowledged in public, especially as Pastor Scott, but not when I'm in the whiskey aisle. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an amen from somebody? (laughs) Pastor Scott! No, Pastor Scott, really, you know, whatever. Uh, You know, to be acknowledged in public and be like, you know, hey, Pastor Scott, people are like, whoa, there's a pastor here, right? Like, there's something fun about that, right? But you don't seek out this, this reputation, right? You don't seek out to be sat in front, in front and of the church so that everyone can see you. I'm gonna tell you guys about an instance I had. I was in California, late 80s, going to college. I went one semester, that's all I could afford. Met a, met a friend there, black gentleman, who was part of a church in Compton, California. Anyone ever been to Compton, California? I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're white, you probably don't go to Compton, California. But he invited me to go to church in Compton, so I went with him to church, and I walk in this church, and the music's going, and it's a a black church. I'm the only white guy at church, right? So I walk in with my friend, and the music's going, and and you know it's it's a cool church because they hand you a fan at the door. And not only do they hand you a fan, but the fan has an advertisement for the local funeral home and mortuary on it, right? So everyone gets a fan and, you know, everyone's fanning themselves and the music's just pumping, right? And then after the music, they actually stop and they're like, we want to acknowledge visitors here with us today. And they look down at me and my friend and they're like, who's your friend? As if I didn't stand out already, right? My friend introduces me, right? All of a sudden the band starts pumping. They're like, hey, we just, we got Scott Morgan here today. And all of a sudden the band started like this bass and this <laughs> And all of a sudden, people start standing up, and they're clapping. And all of a sudden, this guy down, come down the aisle with this big robe, right? And he puts this robe on me. And all of a sudden, people are dancing around, and they're ushering me up on the stage. And I'm, like, given this, this robe, and I'm given this chair up on the stage. And I sit down, and I'm like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? And this idea, like, I'm going, this feels pretty good. I, I, I have to admit, this feels pretty good. 
And you know, I understand their heart was like, they want to make the visitor feel welcome. Imagine we did that, right? For every single person that came, who's here for the first time? Dun, 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 dun. Get the robe, get the chair. But you know what? I didn't seek that out for myself. They wanted to do that as an act of, hey, welcome. We, we love you, we appreciate you. But if I sought that out, you guys would question like, what's he trying to build here? Because really, Jesus is addressing the topic of motives. Like, do you seek out those positions of honor? Do you seek to have a reputation? Or do you seek to be a person of character before God? Because I'm gonna tell you right now, seeking reputation and having character are two separate things. Reputation is what others think about you. Character is what God knows about you. Matter of fact, write those two words down. Reputation is what others think about you. Character is what God knows about you. See, you are going to be continually faced with the choice to do something for your glory or God's glory. It can't be both. I pray that you will be the person that doesn't seek to be worshipped, but you are going to be the person that seeks to offer up worship. With whatever you do, whatever you say, may we do it all for the glory of God. Paul says this, right? Whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. John chapter five, verse 44, Jesus tells the, the religious leaders the same thing once again. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? You exist to bring one glory and that is not you. You exist to bring God glory. See, God values character. He doesn't value religious titles or seats of honor. So, he, so here's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you content to have only the approval of God in your life and that's it? Right, because here's what these men sought. They sought the approval of others. And I'm gonna tell you, if you seek the approval of other people, that is an insatiable desire that will never be satisfied. But if you seek only the approval of God, it doesn't matter what others may think about you or say about you. I, I mentor a Korean pastor out of California who's actually starting a, a coffee house church plant, so I don't know why he picked me, but you know, he's starting a coffee house thing in, in, in Orange County. And we meet via Zoom on every week, and uh, last week he asked me, he said, um, what happens when you encounter people who, who don't like your model of ministry? And I said to Caro, I said, Caro, this may sound unloving, but I said, I don't care what others think about the ministry I'm doing. He's like, as if that's revolutionary. Because here's what, if God's called you to do something, do it. Because this has nothing to do with the approval of somebody. This has to do with the approval of God upon your life. This doesn't mean I'm, I'm a closed off callous person that doesn't listen to people. Of course, I surround myself with people who love me and, and they want what's best for me and they're gonna challenge me and they're gonna ask me hard questions. But you can't go through life being concerned about the approval of other people. You go through life with having the approval of God on your life and that can only happen through the personal work of Jesus Christ. Are you content to have only the approval of God on your life? Are you content to live with just a, a seeking his approval and that's all that matters? Because if you don't, you're gonna be busy trying to seek man's approval and the more you seek man's approval, the approval of God won't mean anything to you. That is a dangerous path to be on. Don't choose that path. Seek God's approval, amen? Preoccupation number three, with the externals. So there's not just a preoccupation with the trivials. There's not just a preoccupation with the limelight, but there's a preoccupation with the externals. See, in verse 44, Jesus says, you guys are like whitewashed graves or whitewashed tombs. You ever heard that phrase before and thought to yourself, what does this even mean? Let me explain it to you. There would be visitors for holy holidays that would come into Jerusalem. And because these visitors didn't necessarily know their way around, the Jews did not want them to walk on graves that were unmarked because if you walked on the grave of a person, you were rendered unclean, defiled. So the Pharisees would go out and they would whitewash this grave so that they were set apart. You would know what it was and you would avoid it. 
And so essentially Jesus says to these guys, you're out there whitewashing graves when in reality you should be the ones that are whitewashed. (laughs) Because when people come in contact with you, they're not walking in purity, they're actually rendered defiled. Can you, can you imagine God saying to you, you actually defile people by your presence. You defile people by your teaching. You defile people by them coming in contact with you. You should be the person that is setting them on a trajectory towards purity, and you're not. You're setting them on a path toward defilement. And Jesus says to this group, you are the source of defilement for people and not the source of purity. And I'm going to tell you right now that this happens in the church more than we'd like to admit. Men and women who have been called by God to help people walk in holiness, and we do the exact opposite. This week, Kenneth Copeland, anyone know the name Kenneth Copeland? He's a, he's a health, wealth, prosperity guy. I'm not a huge fan. He was popular this, this past season because he's the pastor that has the meme, be gone COVID, and he's screaming and he's going crazy or whatever. But so guess what happened? The Russians have hacked into Pastor Copeland's accounts. Can I tell you right now? This guy's worth $800 million. I mean, I'm almost there as a pastor, but I'm not at that level yet. So um, $800 million as a pastor private jets, mansions, things like that. The Russians have hacked in and have information on him that they're now holding because they want ransom for the information. Can I tell you right now, if Pastor Copeland, now we don't know, we don't know how this story's playing out. Wouldn't it be interesting if next week the Russian hacker said, we found nothing on this guy. We found nothing on him. It's a done deal. I think people are scrambling for Pastor Copeland's ministries. You want to know why? Because oftentimes an $800 million ministry has not helped people grow in personal holiness. An $800 million ministry has not helped people walk in purity. As a matter of fact, an $800 million ministry oftentimes leads people away from Christ than toward Jesus. Now, I'm hoping... I'm hoping that the story ends like this. He is clean and he's got nothing to hide. But the problem is we're going to probably hear of all the mismanagement of money and the the personal this. This is one thing we as the people of God ought not to be. We not ought not to be people who are afraid when the light of God's judgment shines into our lives. We're we're good. We're clean, we're pure, we're whole, and we're going to help people walk with Jesus in the same manner. Amen? See, we don't encourage merely external behavior. Outward cleanliness should never come at the expense of inward holiness. Matter of fact, write that phrase down, inward holiness. May we be the kind of people, the church community, that encourages each other toward inward holiness. Your attitudes, your behaviors, they... That's fine, but what's more important is the heart. I love the fact that I have surrounded myself with people that I meet with regularly. I mean, Brent, Ryan and I meet regularly, and you know, we're always talking about, how are you doing? Are you encouraged? Are you, are you doing well? Like, the concern we ought to have with one another is exactly that. How's your heart? How's your mind? Are you, are you honoring God? Are you living for his glory? Like, for me, I, I, want, I want a million people like that in my life. We're not concerned about the externals as much as we're concerned about what's going on inside. Because here's what religion does. It's a dangerous cover-up for spiritual deadness on the inside. God has made us alive in Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's live out of that aliveness, shall we? So, so the, 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 the preoccupation with all these things, the, the trivial, the, the, the limelight, the externals, these were all the things and more that the Pharisees were guilty of. And then in verse 45, you you have this guy step up who's a lawyer and says, hey, when you say these things, you insult us too. And Jesus is like, all right, we're going to continue because I love insulting people, right? See, the lawyers are not lawyers in the idea that we think of lawyers. The lawyers were the interpreters of the law. 
See, the lawyers were the ones responsible for interpreting the law and then giving it to the Pharisees to apply the law. So the, the, the lawyers were the experts. There's dangers of legalistic interpretation. Look at these points here, three problems that the experts had when they interpret the scripture. And I'm gonna tell you, this, this hits close to home because guess what I like to do? I like to interpret the scripture. That is my calling, that is my gift, that is one way I get to serve you guys as a church. We get to dive into this stuff together and kind of kind of chew it all up. So here we go. The first thing that Jesus accuses these experts in is this, that they had a problem of burdening the people. They made it more difficult for people to love God than make it easier for them to love God. Now I'm going to tell you, a true interpreter of the word of God should make it easier for you to love God. We should not, as, 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 as explainers of the word, make it more difficult for you. So their teaching became a burden, not a blessing. And why was it a burden? Because they would impose upon people things they themselves would not adhere to. Matter of fact, look at verse 46. He says, woe to you lawyers. You weigh men down with your burdens while they don't even lift a finger to, to embrace those, those things themselves. So this week, interesting thing happened in California. Like what, did, what interesting thing doesn't happen in California, right? Gavin Newsom. He is the governor, got busted this week. Two things, he went to a restaurant without a mask on and he dined with a group larger than the state had permitted. And people went crazy, you wanna know why? Because if you're caught without a mask and you're dining with a larger group, you are not only fined $1,000 for that violation, you could spend up to six months in jail. In California, what's that? With what? With health officials. So here they were in Napa Valley, swanky, at a restaurant called the French Laundry, swankier. And there is the governor, and guess what the governor doesn't have to do? Pay a thousand bucks. Guess what the governor doesn't have to do? Spend time in jail. All the governor has to do, why? Because he's the governor? Issue an apology. And people are irate. You want to know why? Because they've imposed a burden that even now the officials don't have to adhere to. Do you see, do you see how, how wrong this is? Now, I'm not here to debate the importance or, or unimportance of face masks. I'm not here to debate number of people that should be eating at the French Laundry. I mean, I'm fine with a party of one at the French Laundry. I don't know about you. But all I know is when you start imposing rules that you yourself are not ready to abide by, you're going you're gonna to experience conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, God never puts a burden upon us that, number one, he's not ready to strengthen us to do, and that, number two, it's not going to be for our good and ultimately for his glory. Can I tell you, there's a lot of expectations in the scripture when it comes to, to being a follower of Christ. Has anyone ever experienced the, being a Christian being an easy journey? Just raise your hand. Is it easy? It's not. But here's what we know. With expectations comes encouragement. And, and I want you to write those words down in your notes. You have to have expectations, and God gives us expectations, but he also gives us encouragement. And that's not just encouragement from him via his Holy Spirit. That's encouragement as us as a church community saying, we're going to do this together. See, expectations and encouragement work hand in hand because the experts of the law, you know what they did? They took the Ten Commandments, they developed 619 commandments out of those 10 commandments, and then they developed 10,000 rules to support 619 commandments that came from the 10 commandments. Now, I'm just curious, how many of you want a book of 10,000 rules of how to live your Christian life? None of us. Because that's not what God had intended. God has intended for us to be in relationship with him and live our lives to the best we could for his glory and our good. We were never called to come alongside one another and just call violation, call violation, call. You know what, you're, what you're doing is wrong and adding burden and burden upon one another. I was in a context like that for a long time. Believe it or not, I was in a church that had Pharisees in it. And I was one of those Pharisees. Can I just tell you right now? We're all born legalists in this world. We have to develop into Pharisees. And some of us have become better Pharisees than others. So I'm in a church years ago with some other Pharisees. 
and they decide that it's no longer their desire and they believe it's the will of God for me to no longer be the pastor of that church. So they ask for my resignation. I compose a letter. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the toughest letter to compose because it's not a black or white issue. I, part of me goes, you know, there's no moral infidelity. There's no embezzlement of, of church money, right? This, this is purely a philosophy of ministry where they feel like I'm not the person that's gonna take the church into the next chapter. So they asked me to compose a letter based upon what I believe that through reflection that God's asking me to, to share with the church of, of why they asked for my resignation. So I compose this letter. And then I read the letter for the church the morning I'm leaving. And can I tell you right now, the response from people, it, it was this. So I'm reading the letter. And after I'm done, there's people just kind of gasping. And a couple of people stand up and go, why again are you asking him to leave? Because what you have in this letter is stuff that's true of all of us. And if he can't live up to that, what makes you think we as the church can live up to this? and they all start leaving. People start leaving because they go, you're adding burdens. You're, you're adding a burden onto Pastor Scott's life that, that really, is he, is he called to bear? And you're gonna treat him because he can't live up to your expectations? And if you're gonna ask him to leave, when, when are we gonna be the next ones you ask to leave? And these people just left. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the problem with this, this situation years and years and years ago many of those people have never stepped foot back in a church again because they don't want pharisaical Christianity. They don't want legalistic Christianity. They don't want this burden. It's not black or white, right? It's a, can't you guys work through this? Is this not just a matter of opinion, right? It's one thing if there are black and white concrete issues, but there weren't. And now you're making these burdens impossible to bear up under. We're out of here. And I feel so sad for those people. I'm going to tell you right now, worst moment in my life, yes. Most freeing moment of my life, yes. You are not meant to bear up under the burdens that other people impose upon you. You're meant to live for the glory of God to desire his will for your life, to, to embrace his expectations, but realize that along the way, none of us are gonna do it perfectly. Guess what? We're all gonna mess up. Didn't we not say that to each other last week when we leaned over and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw you over? Remember that? Some of you were like, what? I missed that. Yeah, turn to your neighbor and say this. I'm gonna screw you over. I'm sorry ahead of time. Okay, you don't have to if you don't want to. Matthew 11. Look what Jesus says here. Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ladies and gentlemen, when you serve God, here's how you know whether it, you're serving God genuinely. Your service doesn't lead to guilt. It leads to grace. Your ministry before God and with one another is a ministry that doesn't lead to guilt. It leads to grace. And if you are experiencing grace in your life, let me just tell you right now, you're doing the Lord's work. Number two, there's the problem of bearing the prophets. So it's not just burdening the people and making it harder for them to love God. You're bearing the prophets. Let me just tell you real quick about the prophets because Jesus goes into some length here. This is the only woe that he, he really spent some time with. And here's the problem. The prophets were the ones who brought God's message to a rebellious people. And instead of repenting, the people rejected and killed the prophets. And I'll tell you, it is a dangerous thing to bring God's message into the world. And if you think you're going to get out unscathed with God's message, you're wrong. The fact that the world has its own values, it has its own worldview, it has its own God, and it doesn't want you perpetrating upon it some other, some other message. Whenever you bring the message of Jesus to, to bear upon the lives of men and women, you will face rejection. 
And Jesus says from Abel to Zechariah, this is the bookends of the prophets of the Old Testament. Abel was the first prophet to be killed. Zechariah was the last to be killed, though Jesus himself would ultimately be crucified for his message. See, they buried the prophets. They built these glorious tombs to the prophets, but the problem was this. They rejected the message of the prophet. See, the law was given so that we may know the will of God. The prophets came along to see how well we were following the will of God. And when people don't want God, they certainly don't want to hear a message from you about following God. So guess what? We'll get rid of you. And Jesus would ultimately be delivered up as the greatest prophet, the son of God who served as prophet, priest, and king. And he would be crucified. Why? Because the message given to the religious elite was rejected. And so they would ultimately crucify the son. Which then brings us to our last point. There's the problem of blocking the path. Look at verse 52. He says, you have the key to knowledge and yet you did not enter it yourselves and you hindered other people from entering it. It is a sad thing when you are entrusted with the very answer to life's difficulties and you don't share it. The key to life's difficulties, life's problems, the meaning, the significance, the purpose, the answer is this, Jesus. Jesus is the key. Matter of fact, write that phrase down. Jesus is the key. Without Jesus, we will always give the wrong solution to life's difficulties. Have you ever tried to figure out something pertaining to life without Christ and just end up making matters worse? When you don't understand marriage in light of Christ's when you don't understand parenting in light of Jesus, when you don't understand relationships in light of, of, of Jesus, you're going to get life wrong. Jesus is the answer to it all. And these men withheld the key. And not only did they not enter it themselves, they hindered other people from entering. Let me ask you right now, are you a door to people finding this meaning to life, or are you a wall? Write down those two things. You can either be a wall or a door. A wall from preventing them from, from getting to Jesus, or you a door to, to getting them to the answer, which is always Christ. The answer is always, always Christ. The knowledge they had could have unlocked the door to the Messiah, the, the, the kingdom of God, and yet they concealed it, not only for themselves, but for others. You look throughout Scripture, Jesus is the answer through and through. Don't hinder, but help people see meaning, destiny, purpose, significance, all found in Christ. Last point. So we not only have the, 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 the practitioners, not only do we have the experts, but, but there's the moralists. We're going to call, this is all of them lumped up into one group because they were fixated upon moralism. Which means if I only act a certain way, if I behave a certain way, if my morals are in line, I'm okay, which is not true. We don't believe in a moral therapeutic deity. We believe in one who wants to work on our hearts. Because out of the heart, we behave. Out of the heart, we act. And that's what honors God, right? So the dangers of legalistic renunciation, look at verse 53, 54 as we close this up. When Jesus left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile to question closely Jesus on many subjects and they plotted against him to catch him in something he might say. Those are all hunting terms in those verses. Jesus is now the prey and they're going to go after him full throttle. But yet, if you try to dismiss Christ, you ultimately don't destroy him, you destroy yourself. You end up shooting yourself in the foot. Here's what these men did not do. They did not repent. Here's what these men did not do. They didn't find ultimate freedom, right? Because when you renounce Christ, 
There is no life, there is no freedom, there's no liberty in that. So let's let God do the work in our hearts that he wants to do. Making sure that we're living, living for his glory. Make sure we're the type of people who, we don't want to be the ones that Jesus says, you honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from me. We have a God who says to obey is better than sacrifice. We have a God who says, I love you as you are, where you are, but I'm not going to keep you there. We're going we're gonna to grow together. And guess what? It's going to be messy. We're going to make mistakes. We're going we're gonna to really botch things up. But you know, it's okay because his grace is greater than our sins. And we are in this together. So guess what? Let's just stop being hypocrites. Amen? Let's stop being legalists. Let's stop being Pharisees and, and Sadducees and scribes. Boo! Let's just be men and women who authentically not only walk with God, but authentically live with one another. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, the time we've been able to, to hear about your work in downtown Phoenix. We thank you for the fact that you're a God on the move. And you're working at all times all around this, this globe. And we are just thankful to be able to participate in your work. Thank you that we got a chance to adore you through the music and we got a chance to, to hear your word. And I hope be challenged and be convicted by things that have come forth from your word. I know I have been. Lord, we want to live for your glory. We desire to be people who whether it be in public or in private, we're the, we're the same person. We're consistent in our character. We, we want to make sure, Lord, that we are, we are walking with you with our hearts just constantly being examined and evaluated, letting you speak into us and us having the courage to even look at ourselves. May we be men and women who are motivated by grace and not guilt. May we be men and women who encourage and exhort, embody truth and grace, not only to one another as a church community, but to the world at large, because they are dying without Christ. They're dying in their state of unforgiveness, and they're dying because there's so much ungrace that's being displayed. May we go forth boldly, courageously, full of mercy in taking the message of Christ to the uttermost parts of this world. Thanks for loving us, for giving us this time together, for being a God who adores us and loves us so much that you gave your son for us. Thank you for taking our sin and giving us your righteousness and freeing us from the bondage of sin and decay. Let us live for your glory and our good forever and ever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day. Make sure you meet Pastor Ricky and his wife, Sherry. Hear more about their ministry. Have an awesome day, church. We love you. Bye-bye.